Hey man, so uh, can you tell me uh, what it was like growing up in D.C., bro? Oh man, <laughs> I gotta ask. Uh, it it was it was hard and rough, and it's a very challenging place to grow up. Pretty much, other cities are the same way, but. I experienced growing up in D.C. and it was rough. I've been shot twice, and my brother was. Yeah. You grew up pretty much like a regular, regular household, regular, you know, parents and things like that. Or was you brought up with like Big Mama and Grandma and stuff like that, or what? No, uh, just my mom and uh, I had some aunts in the house with us when I was a kid, and then we moved to our own little apartment. It was uh, my mother had three boys. Mm. And you know, you did you have siblings? Yeah, two brothers. Yeah, was y'all like uh, some fighters? No, um, I started boxing at ten years old. Um, my brother, he was fifteen at the time. We five years apart. And my other brother, eight years apart. He was um eighteen at that time. But um, one of my brothers was the singer, the oldest one. He liked to sing, so he tried to be Luther Vandross. <laughs> and uh, my other brother, uh, he was a pretty boy. His name was Michelangelo, so he wanted all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> so so you uh, kind of grew up with like a competitive thing with your brothers? No, no. I was the youngest. I was totally different. I love to play and have fun, man. I like riding bikes and climbing trees. That's dope. That's <laughs> dope. So at what point did you find your way into a boxing gym? At 10 years old. How did, how did, that, how did that moment happen? What, how did it go? Um, I was down at the gym at the recreation center called Kenilworth Parkside. And um, at, they had practice at 7 o'clock from seven to nine. And um, that's where all the kids pretty much went to hang out and stuff and play. And um, I was looking in the gym because they had basketball courts in there. So they would have the gym floor closed off for boxing at seven o'clock. And at seven o'clock, I was looking in the doors and the coach seen me looking in there. And he asked me, said, you want to box? And I was like, no. <laughs> and um. He said, well, you're going to have to come in or he will close the door. Because he didn't want to do it. So I closed the door and I went on back to doing what I was doing. Then the next day, 7 o'clock came. I go back and look in the door again. And he seen me over there looking in the door. So he asked me to come in and sit down. I came in and I was watching them practice and stuff, shadow box. Hit the speed. Everybody loved the speed bag when they were a kid. <laughs> so guys were hitting the speed bag and stuff and hitting the heavy bag. And he said, you don't want to box? I said, no. He said, um, do you know how to fight? I said, yeah, I know how to fight. I was a little boy. Everybody think they know how to fight when they are a kid. Yeah, of course, until you realize you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, boxing is a sport. I said, so what do you get if you win? He said, you get a trophy or a medal most of the time. And he took me to the to the office and he showed me all these trophies. And he's like, see these trophies right here, they belong to some of the fighters in the gym. And um, I said, why they don't take them home? He said, they got so many trophies, they just leave them at the gym in the trophy case. But, Dang, they getting trophies like this? And, and I'm only 10 years old, so it was kids in there Younger than me. And um, I went home. I said, I'm going to ask my mother, can I box? And I went home and I asked her. And she said, no, she wouldn't allow me to box. But you know, you know, as kids, we hard head, we don't listen. So you went back. She told me, no, the next day I went back. I'm in there practicing, practicing. Mm -hmm. Months go by practicing. So the um, Silver Glove tournament came up. And that was like in November, December. Had to get that permission slip signed. Damn. So I had to go back to her and ask her again. 
And I said, Ma, I've been practicing. I'm good. I'm good. So she gave me an ultimatum. She said, you got asthma, and you know you're not supposed to be boxing. I can't um, play in the grass, play football or nothing, because the grass make my asthma flare up. And um, she said, if you don't win this fight, you're not allowed to box. So I won my first fight, brought home that trophy. And, uh, at, at, at that point in time, who, uh, if you can remember who – who were people that were in the mainstream of boxing that you looked to, or did you look to them at all? Uh, at that time, Mark Johnson, <laughs> he, he was um, a, a, a very known national fighter at that time, traveling. His name was ringing, ringing out because he fought, I think he fought at like Flyway 108. Um, another fighter, um, Jamal Hinton. Uh, Daryl Lattimore, Daryl Tyson, Keith Holmes. Uh, he was getting ready to go pro at that time. So, so from from being a ten year old, bucking the system, going against mom, falling to the gym. What point do you go? Hey, man, I'm gonna take this a lot more serious. When, when does that happen? It happened early in my life. Um, when I got probably like. 14, 15 years old, because from the time I turned 10 and I started practicing and I had my first fight, um, it was an opportunity for me to travel. And most us athletes, we come from poverty, low-income housing. And if you get an opportunity to go out of town and you don't have to pay, you go do it. Yeah, and that just opened up doors for me to travel from state to state. And the first time getting on an airplane and um, going to Russia, had to get a passport. I mean, I got a chance to see the world because of boxing. Did, did you participate in other sports prior to that? I tried football um, earlier, like when I was about 14, 15 years old. But... I ain't like nobody hitting me. And I can't hit back. <laughs> I, yeah. So, so, you, so when you say you took it serious early, what, what part? What, what, what point in time do you do you get with a coach or you know somebody that takes you seriously outside of you saying this is what I want to do? Um, it was the relationship that we had in the boxing gym with all the fighters and the coach. And we took it serious. Well, I took it serious, and they took it serious because you don't get a chance to go to Tennessee, to Ohio, uh, to Michigan, to those other states, and it's free. All you have to do is win your fight. Yeah. You don't have to pay for the hotel room. You don't have to pay for food. They feed you. I'm from the, the ghetto, the projects, and to make it out of there, all you got to do is practice and win a fight, that was an opportunity for me, man. It changed my life. Were there, were there other uh, elite athletes, may not necessarily in boxing, but across the board from that area at that point in time where you came from? Yeah, yeah. Um, Star Chow, he was uh, another pro fighter. Uh, great talent, great talent. Um, Ricky Roy, he... Um, he won, I think he fought in the 88 Olympic trials. And he was like another Sugar Ray Leonard. He was bad. But um, the streets got him caught up and his career didn't, never took off. How did, you, how did you avoid that same element coming from the project? How, how were you able to sidestep all those distractions and, and potholes that hold people back? The, the older brothers at that time were selling drugs and everything. And they seen me out there and I seen them, but they knew what I was involved in because they seen me going down to the rec center every day. They would see me do road work, 13, 14 years old little boy. They knew I was boxing. And um, it was times when I would try to go over there when they sitting over there in the cut. And I know they selling, they, they crack, they weed. I would go over there and just try to hang out with them. And they'd be like, they called me Duck at that time. My nickname was Duck. That's what they called you? Name is Duck, D-U-C-K. <laughs> you got to give me the contents of why. 
I was a short little boy. I'm only five six, and growing up, I was short. I was real short, and my mom and them called me duck as a baby. I, they say I used to waddle like a duck because I'm a little bit bow legged, and when I was real small, I was real bow legged. And as I grew a little bit, my legs straightened out. They said, tell me a, a, a high in the, in the amateur point of time for you that happened that stands out heavy as an amateur. The high part? Ooh, 1995 National Golden Gloves. What happened? Um, that was a major tournament that is all over the world. Everybody want to win the National Golden Gloves. Um, you go to the locals first, which you fight at home in your state, and then you have the regionals. That's You travel to another state, and you fight the guys in your regional, and I think it's like four or five other regions that come together. And then once you make make it through the regionals and you win that, you got to go to the nationals. And that's when you're fighting everybody from all over the world that's making it to the nationals. And, and what part of that is the, the golden moment of what you're telling me? It was a five-day tournament. It was six days. We call it the six days of hell back then because every day you had to fight in the National Golden Gloves. The tournament was for six days, mm -hmm. on Monday through Saturday. And you have to make weight every day. That's the hard part also. If you win, right. you got to make weight, and you got to fight the next day. So I had to fight four days out of six. And I fought every day, and there was great fighters in that time. Zab Judah was there. Fighting at 139 pounds. Um, LaChan Shepard, Randall Bailey, and uh, we all had to meet up. And Hector Camacho also was in 139-pound um, weight class at that time. So at the end of the day, it came down to uh, me and our young fighter, LaChan Shepard. I beat him. <laughs> Who else? I beat him, and I won the National Golden Gloves. What? What? Uh, what, what, well, that and you said that was at 139 pounds. Yep. So, where in there do you uh start to think that you could actually have a career at? It, mm. it was before the Golden Gloves. Um, it went. Back. It, didn't it didn't take you getting the Golden Gloves to realize, man, I could have a future with this. No, it it took um. Back in 1992, when I fought um, in the Eastern Trials, and I lost to the fighter Julian Witter, and he turned around and he fought Oscar in Barcelona. It was a championship, and I was one fight from going to Barcelona in 92. Hey, so you got the Golden Gloves moment. That's a high. What was a low place as an amateur where it could have been psychological, it could, been, it could be physical? What was a low place you were at as an amateur? Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say low, but I would say a downing because of um, that okay, down is safe. Um trying to make it into the Silver Glove Nationals. That was another major big tournament that a lot of fighters compete in all over the world and you they were giving out belts. They would give out this the silver glove belt. And I I I lost to this fighter three times every time we fought each other. And he's from DC area. He stopped me from making it to the nationals. His name was Anthony Fields. Mm -hmm. And it was three of them. They called him the Field Brothers and they can fight. You uh Going through that, them highs and these lows. The reason why I ask because this this is building the, the the mental makeup of chop chop poorly going forward. You know what I'm saying? So when you go through these great highs or or you feel those downs and you still a part of the sport as an amateur, that that somewhat had to prepare you for just life in general. You know, what point do you uh? Do you turn pro? What what clicks or what turns in your mind to say it's time? 
Um, after the 96 um, Olympics, once I lost to Fernando Vargas in Olympic um, trials in 96, in going into 95, we was out there in Colorado Springs. And I seen how the politics played a picture because Fernando, he won the Eastern trials, I think the year before that. And he had a name for himself. Um, I took off once I lost in 92. I took off for two years. I didn't box 93 and 94. I done some soul searching and I gathered my thoughts to see that I really want to do this. When you say soul searching, it was just taking time completely away from the sport or what? Yeah, I took time away and wanted to just still ride bikes, climb trees, just have fun. You 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 a real outdoors person, so you know out. is that like a therapy? Yeah, I love camping out in outdoors, man. Yeah, man, I'd be like, man, he in a tent. Let me let me lock my door, you know. <laughs> be a Boy Scout, though. Yeah, yeah. So so you going through like Boy Scouts? You out there camping and cooking up fishing and things like that? You kind of like gravitate to things like that as where you are today. Yeah. Huh. So you turn you turn pro and I mean you, you went on a, a, a nice streak. Uh your first fight as a professional, what's what goes through your head? Okay, duck. This this is what you wanted to do. Now it's time to perform. I mean, there's no like nerve or nothing like that. I was excited. I had butterflies, which pretty much everybody had those. But I was excited because my first pro fight was at my high school I graduated from in Washington, D.C. It yeah. was Wilson. So you you got like a, I, I don't know, it's almost like a, a, a who's who roll call of a resume of, of all the people you shared a ring with. What's, what's one of the most memorable moments as a professional that you have? Mm. My first one off the top, everybody like to say Floyd Mayweather, but that wouldn't be the one. It would be 2001, taking a fight on a five-day notice. Uh, for Felix Flores, um, we were training in the gym on a Tuesday, and um, Johnny Tapia had the main event, and it was at Mandalay Bay here in Las Vegas. We got a phone call from Dana Jameson. She's the president of Don King Productions. And um, they had called my, my manager at that time and um, let him know that it's an opportunity that we may fight if we accept the fight. So when um, my manager called me from the gym, he said, I'm on my way over to your house. I just got finished training. And he got over to my house. I was staying with my mother in DC. And um, he said, um, I got a phone call from Don King off. He said, um, you want to fight Saturday? I said, yeah, I was excited. He said, um, are you ready? He said, this is a 12 round fight. He said, you're fighting for the title. That opportunity doesn't knock that often. That's like once in a lifetime when you get a chance for a title fight on five day notice. I mean other That's amazing. Fights, they get for you to be prepared. It's gotta be something on another level as well. I Here, here's a, a question I got for you. You you fought two uh elite guys or at least a, a lot of guys that, that you fought were elite. But you fought Zab and Floyd, what was it, like back to back? Yeah. Um me and Zab what 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 what, what is uh what's the difference? In the, in the two. Different mindsets and different levels of ability to adjust and experience. Fighting Zab, he was very quick, but he was emotional also. He has a little hot head, and at that time, he didn't control himself as well as Floyd did at that moment. So... And, between the two of them, poise may be the difference. 
more Floyd was more poised and he was just a better fighter at a young age. Back well, well, I mean, you you would probably be able to detail it better than anybody. What what makes Floyd great in the ring? Uh all around the board, his gene, his ring generalship, his his accuracy, his punch placement, his head movement. Uh, he know how to dictate the pace of the fight. He fight when he want to fight. And he's going to make you fight when he's wanting to fight. He's not going to let you dictate how the fight going to go. He find a way to throw curveballs and mix it up and throw you off your game plan. Since, since, you, since you say that about in, in that aspect, I got a question for you. Do, do styles always make fights? Or... Does the more dominant guy just win? No. If that's the case, I'd be I would have won a lot of ones that I should have won, and I didn't I didn't get the decision. Style make fights. A hundred percent of the time. I say eighty five percent. Eighty five percent of the time, styles. And, and the other fifteen percent will go to what? The 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 aggressiveness, the will. The pressure on top of putting your your style in the ring. So yeah, 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 yeah. In the ring, resume is is otherworldly. Are there pe more people that you spar with over the course of this career that you have that are notable to you, like in your heart, to be like, man, I spar with that guy. First on the list, Pernell Whitaker. That was my idol. He was my role model. He was my mentor. And um, I'm sparring him right after I turned pro. And I'm helping him get ready for a rematch fight with Rafredo Rivera's. What uh, what was the aspect of you? Was it your amateur career? Did they see something in you? What was it physically in the style? What made them come and get you for that? Um, I think it was my style, me being a southpaw, and uh, Lou Duva was already scouting fighters because he, he had Zab Judah at that time also. And um, it was a great opportunity to, uh, for them to take a look at me and Purnell to see my style of boxing. He knew he who's was... A, who's your favorite fighter of all time? My favorite? Number one on the list... I'm going to go with Purnell first. Why? And he's a southpaw. And he's very slick. And I market my style off of being slick, hit, and try not to get hit. But on top of him, I had to go with uh, Marvin Hagler, who's a come forward fighter. I don't like to fight off the ropes and back up and use the ring for boxing. Purnell, he's a very slick fighter. He's not a box. So, you got, you got a slick guy, and then you got, like, a come-forward guy. Is that what you would say make you? Yes. That's that, that's really unique. Who, uh, who today do you like that's an active guy, uh, no matter the weight class? But who do you like today go like, man, I like the way that guy does it? Uh, first on the list, I would go with um, Tank. Hmm. How so or why? He's a bad motherfucker, man. That, yep. that that young gorilla, he is a force to be reckoned with. He seems to have a deceptive uh IQ. I think he's uh his uh actual boxing ability is underrated. Yeah, they are. Because most people doesn't get a chance to see his abilities of boxing because he's pretty much getting everybody out of there. The kid can box. Yep. You, you ever spar with him? I haven't got a chance to spar with him yet. Uh, I know that you sparred Devin Haney. Yeah. Detail that for me. How'd that go? Me and Devin Haney sparred back in 2015 when Floyd was getting ready for Pacquiao. 
that was the first time I worked with him. And his dad told me, look, Chop, I need to see where my son at. I need you to come in and work with him. Don't hold back. I want you to push him. Show me what he really can do. And uh, we worked six rounds. And from that moment, I told Devin after we got finished sparring, I said, you can be world champion. And he said, for real, you think so? I said, trust me, you're going to be world champion. At that moment, he was another imitating the Floyd Mayweather. You, uh, you, when you tell him you can be a world champion, what in particular did you see in him that made it stand out and say, hey, man, that dude there could be a world champion? What, what, what is it that you saw? I seen a comic copy of what I fought in 2004. And that was so the floor so that you saw in 04, the kid was a carbon copy of it in 2015. Yeah. Wow. So that means you say saying speed and IQ and wow. Yeah. He, he really got it like that. He, he, he was like that when he was like 15 years old. I mean, that's. That's a tall order, but then later on he's undisputed. So you know, you know, to some degree, you fought a uh, uh, Kodo. Yep. Tell me about that fight. Oh man, that was a great fight. Um, a moment that we didn't get a chance to capitalize on when I had him hurt. But the experience um, going to Puerto Rico, seeing how they love they fighters in their country. For sure. At the weigh-in, they had to arrest a guy because he was going to try to stab me with a knife. He had a, a flip knife, and he wanted to stick me because I'm fighting Miguel Cotto at the weigh-in. <laughs> Damn. Is that serious? They, they arrested him, yeah. He, he was talking, saying what he was going to do, and then he pulled out a knife, and he, he went around some people, and we didn't see him, so we called security around. And yeah, they got him. Man, that, that's, that's got to be an event. I asked you that because I know during that fight you hurt Miguel Cotto. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, it's years later. I always want to dig into the psyche of how somebody feels looking back at it like, you know what? I had a guy who I needed to have him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it was a great moment for me. Um, we trained for a certain way for that fight. And the game plan was to take Cotto in the later rounds because we knew he was much bigger, yeah. much stronger, and he had to lose weight to make the fight. He barely made 140, but the so next- So you think he, he was depleted or dehydrated? He was completed. He looked like he had a twin brother. <laughs> he looked one way, on Friday, the next day, he looked at like he went and had a marshmallow put inside. Wow. He, he blew so, up. His face was, his arms, his whole body structure was very thick. So we knew Cotto was going to be strong in the first six rounds of the fight. So we wanted to box him, place our shots, move. And um, the game plan was working. But Cotto's a very smart fighter. He knew he was in trouble. He hit me low on the cup, and he neutralized. When he hit me on the hip, it numbed my leg. So I took a knee. And that was the worst thing I could have done. Yeah. But I thought in a fight, if you get hurt, taking a knee is smart. It, it, it could be calculated. It's a calculated risk. Yeah. Because, I mean, I took the knee. I got the knockdown, but the ref weighed the fight off. I'm like, I thought I was doing something, trying to get myself together. I'm taking the knee, but no. In, in 2011, you, you was on something else because I think that, that one year you, you fought like Lucas Matisse, Delorme, Provodnikov, all in 2011. <laughs> Just straight up, you 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 like went on like a like kamikaze, you know. Let's do it. What 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 had you there in 2011 to say 
I'm gonna fight some damn good guys a lot this year. It wasn't even about the fighting the good guys. It was just I'm gonna stay dedicated. I'm gonna stay in the gym. When I would lose a fight, I'll go right back the next day or that Monday. I'm back in the gym training. I didn't let the loss depress me, complete me, make me not want to do it no more. It was just, I'm going back to the gym, get back on this horse, and I'm going to ride this thing some more. I want to be champion again. That, that, I mean, tell me about that provider car fight. Going to Russia, I had no problem with traveling, so I didn't care if I went to his hometown. And um, I beat Ruslan. I'm not lying. The people over there know I beat them, but when you're fighting in a person's country and you got the fans and the, the judges behind you, I even got a knockdown in that fight. I won that fight. They didn't give it to so, me. So you've traveled a lot in, in your career. Tell me how significant is it for Devin to have gone to Australia twice? That, that really is, was important. That made a statement in his career. Beat you once in your country. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do it again. That, yeah. that really boosts Devin equity. Because that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough road to, to travel, you know. You, you don't see – one reason why I mention that is because, well, one, you sparred him before he even got the show going, but – you don't see that type of a uh, move from a lot of American guys. They try to stay out of other people's country, yeah. Right. Because they know you ain't going to get a fair shake. It ain't going to be a no. plan, boy. It may be a 70-30 or 60-40. You got to have some type of supreme confidence to do that. To say that there's nothing this guy can do, that even for you to even rob me. Devin, Devin was a fight. He's a fighting motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> No, man. So you got to tell me, what is frog fit? Uh, it's a strength and conditioning equipment. And a lot of football players, NFL players, they use the equipment in, in football and college camps and stuff. Uh, I have two of them now. They both out there on the, in, the, in the storage. And uh, it's for strength and conditioning. It helps build your muscles up, make you stronger, and it's a great workout. You, you do it today. Yeah. Is that, this got to be something else, like, I don't know, some special kind of juice, or I don't know. How are you able to be so active as a fighter, even late, later than an average fighter would still be fighting? How are you able to keep doing it? I think, I mean, growing up, I was blessed. God let me see a lot of things in life, and I had a chance to make a decision. Do you want to do this? You see what they're doing and how it deteriorates their body, which is drinking, smoking, clubbing, or do you want to dedicate your life to becoming a boxer and doing the right thing in life? And I chose to do the right thing, man. So Being twice. So just, just those those typical temptations of Drinking, smoking, that never got you, would you say? I tried it. I was I used to go to the go go and hit the clubs. I like to dance. Um I I tried to smoke in that weed, but I didn't like to smoke with people. I want to smoke my weed by myself because I didn't want to share. See? <laughs> yeah, see, but see back then, you had like four other people with you. And everybody want to hit your blunt, and you got to pass it. By the time you get it back, it be like this. <laughs> Not worth it. Nah. Not worth the price of admission. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfuckers. See? But, you know, um, I, I just I just watch how a lot of people find a way to navigate around the distractions and stuff like that. Here's another question for you. At what point do you turn into the hood version of Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> um, Cause Chop Chop be in the kitchen. I mean, I was cooking back in 20, 2004. When I when I fought Mayweather, we were in camp. 
and um, I was in North Carolina and Don Don Turner's camp. Uh -huh. And uh, I showed my skills there, and Don let me cook like a couple of days out of training camp because he seen that I liked to cook and I was good in the kitchen. What's the most uh, exquisite meal that Chop Chop prepares like nothing? Uh, I would got to go with my lamb. I love lamb chops. Yeah, I be seeing you with the lamb chops, man. I ain't going to lie. Lamb what, what you like about the lamb chops? They taste so good, and I'm not a steak. <laughs> I don't, I don't eat steak. I had, I hey, had, uh, my boy, my boy Chuck say Chop be cooking his ass off. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that, that I mean, because I don't think I don't think anybody can even avoid that about watching you do you. Like, man, this man be in the kitchen. You know, did you uh, pick up cooking from from mom or what? I I was a mama's boy because I was the youngest. Right. But my my two older brothers were outside doors boys and um she wanted them to get in trouble. Right. So you uh kind of picked up them tools and then I'm sure later on in life you like that. Women really like this shit. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. So let me put a little bit extra salt on that one. <laughs> nah. Um, my, my mother told me at a young age when I was a kid, she's like she said, Duck, I'm going to show you how to do everything a woman can do just in case you don't have one. And I said, I said, Mom, I'm going to have a I'm gonna have a woman. I'm going to have a wife. She said, but she may not know how to cook. So I want to I wanna make sure you can cook your own food just in case she's not able to cook for you. Chop, Chop, what's a, what's a lesson or a, a, a piece of game that you gathered over all this time of all this experience that a guy who uh, just got into a box and he's just turned pro. He's only got three, four fights. What, what, what could you tell him that he may not learn until down the road? What, what's a key thing that he needs to know? Practice is not only at the gym. You don't only train when you go to the gym. It's very important that you train at home. You may not have the boxing ring. You may not have a lot of space. But you got a bathroom and you have a mirror. And mirrors are very important in a boxing gym. Come on, give me the give me give me the significance of it. You get a chance to see yourself throwing your punches. And you have to imagine you throw a punch, you gotta move your head. So you gotta slip your jab or your left hand coming back. So it's always you're boxing yourself. It's a mirror. You see yourself. So you punch and you move your head. So you're shadow boxing. And that's where shadow boxing comes from. So basically, that was anything you could tell them young guys is it don't start in the gym. It started well, home. It started in the gym with your trainer. But it comes home with you. You got to take it home with you because you're not going to see your trainer no more until the next day. Right. You still got to practice on what you worked on in the gym. Do it at home. It's homework. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's what's this thing that you're doing with bare knuckles? I love to fight. I ain't going to lie. I grew up in D.C. I don't mind a fist fight. As a kid, <laughs> that's what we used to do. But they used to slap box a lot. I never played that. You ain't slapping. Slap boxing is, is, is slightly disrespectful. If you gonna slap box, the joker gonna end up balling his fists up, and then y'all gonna be fighting for real. Anyway. Fighting, fighting, yeah. So why? So, why not? So you why? just don't mind fighting, and that's why bare knuckles is cool. I love fighting. It's cool. It's cool. So God, dog, man, are you gonna ever participate in that again? I would, of course. Yeah. Man, that, that seemed it seemed tough. That seems tough. No, nah, it's just the proper training and um, toughening your hands up. And it's a thought that always play in your head. You're going to break your hand. What if you break your hand? That's the only thing I worry about after the fight, breaking a hand. Huh. I, ain't worried if, about, uh, I ain't worried about the cuts. So above all, in your whole entire pro career, if somebody were to say, hey, man, Chop Chop was blank. How would you describe Chop? 
Man, Chop Chop was SKD. That's who I am. It's SKE? SKD. Well, what with that, with that break down there? Something kind of different. I'm with that one too. Something kind of different. So eventually, uh, one day you go uh, get into the reins of a trainer, a coach, or no? Yeah, we're go I'm a train fighter. Uh, we're working on some projects. I'm not going to reveal them, but um, 2023, I'm working on a couple new projects. Yeah, serious projects. Um, one I'm going to reveal. I'll be working on my books soon. So you got a book coming out? I'm going to do a book, yeah. My story. My wow. Book. What is it, it going to be like? The memoirs of? Or? Um, it's going to be about my life. Mm. My life, wow. my dreams, my passion, and uh, what what motivate and give me the drive to continue to do this. Yeah. Well, since we're here, what does give you the drive and the motivation to do it? Is a race that I started that's not finished yet. And um, I don't see it being finished until I reach those levels in my life where I'm successful. You got to you gotta, you gotta, uh, make sure you document all these recipes, too, because that's another book. <laughs> when I, Straight I, up. When I say successful, I, I think uh, I think I think your voice is uh important in the sport. The eye that you have, the interactions, the experience, even all the way down to where you come from, and 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 guys like you, you actually are somebody. As a matter of fact, in this live, you got a lot of young fighters that just tuned in and hopped in and hopped out because the name ring bells, and they know you've had that type of experience that they want. You know. Uh, is there anything, any regrets? Regrets? No regrets on my boxing, no. Not even beating Floyd? Not no, almost beating Floyd? <laughs> hey, why, 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 why Floyd said, hey, shut up and quit, quit bitching and fight? What you tell him? What you was saying? He was, he was telling me he was going to stop me. He fought my best friend, James Baker. And uh, at the weigh-in and everything, he's like, yeah, I'm going to do you like I've done your best friend, James. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. You too small. You too small. And I'm like, you ain't going to stop me, man. You don't punch hard enough. You don't have a power. Because as of lately, that that moment been been moving around everywhere. And I'm like, what are what Chop told him? He, he wanted to stop me bad. He wanted to make a point at 140. That was his debut at 140 pounds. Yeah. So he just wanted to stop us. That's all. Huh. Chop, man, we appreciate you, bro. You were, you were a legend in a lot of these guys' eyes. A lot of these guys tuned in just to see your face. It was people in there saying, man, you know, he from where I'm from. And, you know, you read your story resonate with people. And uh, people got a lot of love for you. So what's, what's going to happen next for Chop? Uh, Chop, my goal is to do three more fights. I'm going to tap out at 90 fights. i got 87 now. I want to do three more. Uh, Chop Chop's Kitchen is coming. I will be cooking in the kitchen. Uh, eventually, we're going to do the book, a documentary about my life. That's very important. My documentary is very important because I've been shot twice. But oh, man, Chop, you didn't tell me that, man. When, when, when were you shot? What age was you shot? 1997, November 26th. Wow. Wrong place, wrong time? Or? No. Had on the wrong coat at the wrong time. You remember the Eddie Bauer coat? Yeah. It was November 26th. I had a dream, though. But see, this is why my story got to be told. When you go to sleep, yes. we all have dreams. And then you wake up the next day and you go to the gym and you telling your friends about your dream. Your dream come true that evening. I dream I was in a shootout. I was getting shot. Fight on the up and coming car coming up with Dusty? No, I'm not on that card in DC. Okay. Okay, I, okay. Actually it was. 
Man, Chop, man, we appreciate you. We know you about to go get some work out on or go, go. Chop, here's another question before we get out of here. Who are your favorite musicians? Because I know you listen to some real eclectic oldies, some, some, some of that funk. You be listening to everything. I be hearing you. I be hearing you in the background. Who you like listening to, bro? Uh, Maze and Frankie Beverly. James Brown. Yeah. Them, them the go-tos. James Brown, number one on the list. So if we hop in Chop's car right now, what's playing? I'm going to put on some Pandora and go to James Brown. Chop, man, we love you, man. We appreciate you, bro. Uh, I brought you here just to make sure I put some type of highlight on you, man. We thank you. Next time you in H-Town, lunch on me. You know, man, holla at us, man. But uh, they can find you at uh, DeMarcus Corley 2019. Correct. That's what it is, man. Chop, man. We appreciate you, bro. We're going to make sure we stay plugged into the kitchen. Let us know what you're cooking next, bro. About to whoop up some breakfast right quick. <laughs> That's what's up. We can't wait. We all going to check out the post and all that, man. Much love to you, Chop, man. Thanks for showing up, bro. Thanks a lot. All right, bro. <laughs> Hip-hop. <laughs> 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 <laugh